Hey guys, this is Arthur Hill, Chief Technical Strategist here at TrendInvestorPro.com. Thank you very much for taking some time out on your Saturday to join us for this presentation. We've got trend following today. We're going to go over the theory, the expectations, and the reality, because often when we think about trend following, you see the end result and you see these big returns and you think, wow, that's great. But it's not a straight line to get to those great returns. There are periods of flat returns, there are drawdowns, and it's a zigzag higher, but usually over the long run, trend following is a solid strategy. So today, I want to give you the basics with an introduction to trend following. We're going to go over a couple of indicators. We're going to back test them to set these expectations. We don't want to set them too high. We want to have these realistic expectations, and we'll do that with the performance metrics using back test. You always hear, I've never heard a back test that was, I've never seen a back test that was bad. Well, that person probably never ran a back test because I've seen plenty of bad back tests. But we're going to back test two indicators over 20 years, show you the results, and work through it and show you some tips on how to improve the results. It's kind of an incremental stage is the way you make improvements. You start with the base strategy, and then you add these little incremental adjustments to improve results without curve fitting your system. So let's hit the presentation. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I started off with classical technical analysis, uh, John Murphy, Martin Pring, uh, all of the books on charting and momentum and trends. And then I crossed over to what they might call the dark side, uh, quantitative analysis. And I started using Amy Broker. And that's where I would crunch the data, run the systems. Because what I wanted to do was I wanted to find out, you hear about all these indicators. MACD is crossing over. That's bullish. We're crossing the 50-day. That's bullish. We broke below the 200-day. That's bearish. Well, you hear all about that, but you never really know until you actually test it, how it works and what the expectations should be and actually if it works. So that's why I got into the quantitative side. So I've got a book, Define the Trend and Trade the Trend, and that's the classic technical analysis. I also have a paper on SSRN.com, and it is Finding Consistent Trends with Strong Momentum. And that's using RSI ranges for trend and momentum strategies. Now, a little bit about what I do now. I am currently the chief technical strategist at trendinvestorpro.com. And I've got a composite breadth model for broad market timing. And that's what I use to say if I want to be in stocks or out of stocks. And that goes back to 2003 as far as uh, being tested. I've also got an ETF ranking and signals table with a core group of 129 ETFs. And those are, rank, are not ranked, but they're organized in a logical top-down manner. So you have you know, your major indexes, your sectors, your industry groups, commodities, bonds, currencies. I also do chart analysis, and that's part of the discretionary side we'll get into. Weekly videos and a premium page with some more in-depth articles on strategies for ETFs, exit strategies, trend following for ETFs, and seasonal patterns. So a little bit about my uh, trading style. So I basically have two sides. One is the systematic side, and that's using trend momentum strategies, using the stoke close indicators, the trend composite, and the rate of change. And that's going to be today's focus. We're going to focus on the systematic side. Now, there's also the discretionary side. And I still love going through charts, but I pretty much focus on one thing, and that is pullbacks within the bigger uptrend. I'm looking for bullish continuation patterns, mean reversion setups, and then a little short-term trigger to tell me that the trend has reversed. You can see a classic chart here with XLRE. And this is a pullback within an uptrend into early October, stabilized a little bit and then broke out. And that's kind of my bread and butter trade, if you will, when it comes to discretionary trading. And I feature a lot of that on my website. 
So before we get into this presentation, the standard disclaimers apply, you know all about them. Trading and investing involves risk of loss. Past performance does not guarantee future performance. The data and the results are presumed reliable, but not guaranteed. This, this presentation is for informational purposes only. And please do your own due diligence. At the end of the day, you and only you are responsible for your trading decisions. Learn about something, test it for yourself, see for yourself if it works, and then implement it. So here's what we're gonna go over today. And by the way, at the bottom right, these slides are numbered. So if there's a particular slide that you have a class question on, you can refer to that number. So as far as the trend following is concerned, we're gonna start with the key assumptions and the characteristics of a trend following strategy. Then we're gonna go into the indicators and signals. We've got a number of indicators to show you how they work, what the signals are. Then we'll go over the expectations versus the reality of say an equity curve based on a system over a 20 year period. We're gonna back test these indicators. And then I'm gonna show you how to improve results with a little bit of smoothing, a market regime filter, and then a momentum tie break because you want the stocks with the highest or strongest momentum. And again, past results do not guarantee future results. Keep that in mind. So the key assumptions when we're talking about a trend following strategy, and keep in mind, all strategies are based on assumptions, even fundamental analysts. They make assumptions on revenue growth to assume how fast a company is going to grow. And so we are making some assumptions. The assumption is that once a trend becomes enforced, it will continue until proven otherwise. So trend following is systematic. You have very specific rules for entering and exiting. It's also a lagging strategy. You're never going to catch the bottom when you enter, and you're never going to catch the top. Trend following signals, by definition, lag. Trend followers also assume no predictive power. In other words, you get a signal, they're not going to say, I have a 90% confidence interval that this is going to be a big winner. Trend followers don't make any assumptions. They don't know which signals are going to result in that big trend and which are going to result in whipsaws. There are going to be drawdowns and periods of underperformance. That's just the way it goes. The markets are the markets and there are going to be whipsaws. On these charts, I'm gonna show you these whipsaws because they are a big part of the trend following process and they're pretty much unavoidable. But the good news is a few good trends are gonna pay for those whipsaws. At least that's the assumption, right? Nick Raj of the Chartist in Australia, he's got a great site and you can follow him on Twitter. He also has a, a weekly newsletter he comes out with. He says the next 1,000 trades. So you may have a string of losses, 10, 20, even 30 on a bad run, but you think in the next 1,000 trades when it comes to a trend following strategy. So trend following versus mean reversion, kind of set the stage because these are kind of the two different strategies that are out there. One is buying when things are going up and they're strong. And the other one is buying on a pullback when things have short-term weakness, uh, stocks, ETFs, whatever you happen to be trading. So trend following, you're buying on the uptrend signal and you're typically buying when it's overbought. Mean reversion, you're buying when it's oversold on the pullback. With trend following, you're selling weakness. So you get a downtrend signal, and a lot of times you're oversold when you're selling. As I said, you're not going to catch the top. You're not going to catch the bottom. Mean reversion, you're going to sell when it gets strong, it gets overbought. Trend following, you're going to ride that trend until the end. Mean reversion, you typically have profit targets and relatively quick exits. And as a result, you have fewer trades with trend following, but you have many more trades with mean reversion. Mean reversion is much more active. 
So a trend following, you're going to have longer holding periods because you never know how long that trend is going to run. Mean reversion, short holding periods, a few days, a few weeks. Trend following, your average profit is going to be greater than your average loss, typically three to one. With mean reversion, it's the opposite. Your average profit, you're going to take these little profits and your average loss is going to be a little bit bigger. But you make up for that because trend following, the average profit is big. Mean reversion, the average profit is small. But you have a low win percent for trend following. And so that's why those bigger profits make up for those smaller losses with that 40% win rate. You need a, a bigger profit loss ratio on each trade. Whereas mean reversion, you have a much higher win rate of 70%. And so that's why you can get away with having an average loss that's greater than an average gain. And again, trend following, you're buying the breakout and you're selling the reversal. And with mean reversion, you're buying the dip and you're selling the rip. So when you're thinking about trend following, it's very important to get your time frame uh, in order or to pick a suitable time frame for your trend style. Now, I know everybody has a different version for short term, long term, medium term. But in general, I think the short term favors mean reversion. So short term, I would consider 20 day Bollinger Bands. You go below the lower band, that's oversold. That's a mean reversion setup. Uh, 20 day SMA, you go below the 20 day. I don't think that's a bearish signal. That's more of a mean reversion signal that you've had a pullback. And if you're in an uptrend, it might be an opportunity. Whereas trend following, you want to lengthen that time frame at least three months. But I think this three to six month time frame is ideal. Most longer term uh, fund managers use one year uh, for their momentum and trend strategies. But I like the six month period, 125 day Bollinger Bands, 125 day Commodity Channel Index, as we'll see and the direction of the 125 day moving average. I like to keep it consistent there. So the indicator settings, when you're thinking about them, make sure they match your desired time frame. They should also make sense. I mean, I don't wanna capture a six month trend with a 35 day indicator, that doesn't make sense. Uh, try not to curve fit your indicators, uh, 98 days, that doesn't make sense, you know, just use 100. Um, and again, as I said, three to six months is my sweet spot personally. And I think with the way the market moves have really become, I don't want to say shortened, but, but the trends seem to take shape quicker. Uh, if you look at the COVID crash and the COVID bottom, you know, it was this three to six month time frame that they took more than three months. So things happen pretty quick. And that's why I like that three to six month time frame. And so that 125 day look back is my sweet spot. So now I wanna go over the indicators with some examples of some signals so you can see how these trend following indicators actually work in real life. So we've got moving average crossovers. This is the classic. This is uh, IWM, the Russell 2000 ETF. And you can see we've got the 200 day moving average in red. And the red arrows show when you cross below, and the green arrows show when you cross above. And there's the signal right before the COVID crash. But we get a lot of whipsaws, you can see. And then this oscillator shows when the close is above the 200 day, and it's red when the close is below the 200 day. So there you can see those whipsaws, and, and that's what happens with trend following. But I'm gonna show you how to smooth out those whipsaws. So here is the rate of change of a moving average. So instead of looking for crosses above and below a moving average, wait for the moving average to change direction. And so when the rate of change for this 125 day SMA turns positive, you can see this oscillator turns green. And then you can see when the rate of change turns negative, that means the moving average is turned down, this oscillator turns red. And there you can see the signals here. This is Merck. And you caught a great trend here. And after the great trend, you had a lot of whipsaws, as you can see from those red and green arrows. And we're currently on a bullish signal 
with a breakout. If you want to do some classic TA, you can see a huge triangle throughout uh, from basically March to July, August, September 21, and a big breakout there. So again, there are the whipsaws, and that's a recurring theme with trend following. Here's Bollinger Band breakouts, and this is Diamondback Energy. And appropriately, or, <laughs> it's called Fang, basically. Um, so the middle line is 125-day moving average, and that's the gray line there. And then the upper line is two standard deviations above, and the lower line is two standard deviations below. And in that indicator window, I've got the standard deviation, 125 days. And so you can see it's 11.91. And you actually, I made a mistake here. This is one standard deviation below, above and below. So what basically happens is for a signal, you have to have a break above. And for a bearish signal, you have to have a break below. And you can see when the bands get narrow, you can whipsaw when price action gets choppy. But then we got a fairly good trend and got out in July 2019 to avoid this crash into 2020. And then caught a pretty good trend signal that was whipsawed. But we're back on a trend signal as we got back above that upper Bollinger Band. And the way this works, it's kind of like a filter for your moving average crossover. Instead of going above the 125-day SMA, you're trying to get one standard deviation further. And so that's kind of filtering the signal. Keltner channels, those are very similar to uh, Bollinger Bands, but instead of using the standard deviation, we're using the average true range, which was developed by Wells Wilder. An average true range is also a volatility type indicator. When it's expanding, you've got higher volatility. And when it's contracting, you have lower volatility. And if you look at the Keltner channels, again, we have a 125-day EMA in the middle. And when you get above the upper channel, that's a bullish signal. And when you get below the lower channel, that's a bearish signal. So you get some whipsaws, but you also catch a few good trends. So this is Apple. So there's the bearish signal when we had the COVID crash. And we got a bullish signal in April, and that turned out to be a very good signal. And that's one of those signals that pays for those previous whipsaws. The next indicator here is CCI close. And this is the commodity channel index. It was developed by Donald Lambert. And Lambert traded commodities back in the day. And he noted when he was talking about his commodity channel index that these surges above 100 and below minus 100 could sometimes signal the start of a trend. Now, we also used it for overbought, oversold indications, but I lengthened the time frame to 125 days because that's six months, basically. And I looked for a surge above 100 to turn bullish. And you can see in the indicator window, the CCI, and this is CCI based on closing prices only, because normally the CCI is based on the close and then the high low range. And if you get a spike low, then that's going to broaden that range, widen that range, and that can affect the signals. So I prefer just to use closing prices because that, that mutes the volatility a little bit. And you can see here in October, we got a bullish signal in Tesla. And what a timely signal that was when it was below 100. And you got a bearish signal in the spring of 2021, but you went back on a bullish signal in the late summer, early fall, and that was a timely signal as Tesla moved to new highs. But if you go back to the left here, there you can see the whipsaws. So if you had been trading Tesla on the trend strategy, you would have given up on it. And then you would have had the signal of a, well, not of a lifetime, but that's one heck of a signal but you got to get through these whipsaws to capture these signals. So the next indicator is Stoke Close. And what we have here is the gray is the high-low range of the last 125 days. So you can see as prices move higher, 
that high-low range moves higher. So the upper end of that range rises as prices make higher highs. And then after 125 days, you can see there's the COVID low. As we start making higher lows after 125 days, the bottom part of that range rises. And the green line is equivalent to the 60th percentile of that range. The red line is equivalent to the 40th percentile. So when you get above that green line, you're clearly in the upper half of that 125 day range. The cup is half full, and that is an uptrend. And when you get below 40, as you can see here in 2018, that is clearly the cup is half empty and that's a bearish signal. So this is Google Alphabet, excuse me. And there you can see the stoke close indicator in the lower window. And I was showing you how it works in the upper window on the price chart. But you can see, you're gonna get some whipsaws, but we got a good trend there from 2016, the middle of 2016 until early 2018. And then a great trend from early 2020 until now, it's still an uptrend in progress. So the trend composite. So I showed you five indicators, the previous five indicators, and I put all five of those indicators together and I'm aggregating, aggregating the signals into a trend composite. And it's not a perfect indicator, but it's basically making that threshold a little bit harder to cross. So basically you need three indicators with bullish signals, one, two, three. And if you have two indicators with bearish signals, then you got a plus one and that turns the trend composite green positive. So there we can see in early 2019, we don't need that one yet. So there you can see in early 2019, the trend composite went to plus one and turned bullish for Walmart. And you had a nice run. And then we had a lot of whipsaws. And these are going to happen. These are the COVID whipsaws. But then we got a bullish signal and a pretty nice run. You can see down below the trend composite turned bearish. And that means here was at minus three. And if you're at minus three, that means four indicators triggered bearish signals. One was still on a bullish signal. So that's four bearish, one bullish, that's minus three. And then we can see we got some whipsaws, but Walmart is currently on a bullish signal. And if you want to do some, you know, classic chart analysis, you can see that this is a big triangle formation within an uptrend. So Walmart could be poised to have a big breakout. But, and that's a big but. The challenge is, I found that if you want to trade systematic trend following, you probably better not be looking at the charts. If you want to look at the charts, I think, more often than not, it's best to do so without indicators and just analyze pure price action. Now, this presentation is really for the systematic side of trend following. And so that's why we're accepting the whipsaws. We're accepting we don't know which trends will be the big trends that we need to pay for those whipsaws. We're just going to take the signals and let the chips fall where they may. So anyhow, there's the whipsaw for Walmart. Now, the good news is you can chart these indicators on Stock Charts ACP, and that's through the Trend Investor Pro Indicator Edge plugin. This is a screenshot with Walmart and the Trend Composite and Stoke Close. And here is Stock Charts ACP. And on the lower right, you can see the plugin icon. And if you click that icon, then you will see the plugins available. And there's the Trend Investor Pro Indicator Edge plugin. And there are the indicators over there on the left. There are 11 indicators there. There's a nice ATR trailing stop. It can also be used with a trend following strategy. So here's a tip to help improve your trend following signals. A little bit of smoothing can go a long way. And we're gonna use the Russell 2000 ETF IWM for an example. I showed you that chart before when it crosses above and below the 200 day moving average. And you had all these whipsaws here on the left of the chart. And you got some good signals, but then you had all these whipsaws again on the right side of the chart. 
Now, one thing we can do is we can test to see how these signals actually perform. And so the Russell 2000 started in 2001. So that's why I started my test in 2002. And I ran it until the end of October. So you had 174 crosses. So two crosses makes one signal, cross up, cross down. That's a complete signal. So you had 87 bullish signals complete, 22 winners, only 25%. 65 losers, 75%. That's a lot of whipsaw to go through. And I don't think you would want to be buying and selling every single cross here. So what you need to do is just to add a five-day moving average and smooth out that close. And you're going to em el eliminate quite a few whipsaws. Here we can see on the left, you're still going to get some whipsaws, but quite, quite a few, quite a lot less. And if you look on the right, we only got one cross below with the five day crossing below the 200 day. And we moved back uh, above in early October, right before we broke out to a new high. The Russell 2000 ETF was the talk of the town this week. So I crunched the numbers in Amy Broker to back test these signals. And if you just use the five 200 cross, you had fewer signals, 76 crosses and 38 signals. You had 16 winners, and your winning percent went from 25% to 42%. Not bad. And you're, you had 22 losers, and your losing percent was 58%. And this is kind of about what it's like for trend following. You typically have 40% winners and 60% losers. So let's get into the back test. And before we do, I want to set the stage for these back tests. Back tests help us to better understand a strategy and to set expectations. We want to know what percentage of the time it's profitable, roughly, what's the average gain relative to the average loss, what's the profit factor, and does it have a positive expectation? Do we expect it to make money? So what I did was I tested S&P 500 stocks historical constituents. So if this back test, it goes back to 2000. So Facebook didn't come into the S&P 500 until later. So if we're testing in 2003, Facebook's not in it. So I'm only using historical constituents. And there is the back test period. It's an all signals test in the beginning. We're going to take every single signal and see if it worked or not. We're not using dividends. I consider dividends to be gravy. I don't think they should be part of the return as far as a systematic strategy is concerned. Uh, the signals are on the close. Buy, sell, the next open. We're just going to keep it very simple. No commissions or slippage. And again, I'm using Amy Broker with Norgate for this back test. So if you're seeing somebody that does a back test, the first thing you got to look at is what is the back test period? So if you have somebody that has a back test that starts in 2009 and runs until 2021, I mean, come on, this is one huge bull run. You don't have a bear market. At the very least, you need to start a back test in 2007. You need to include one bear market. And mine starts in 2002. So we have a bear market, a bull market, a huge bull market with you know, a couple of soft periods. And then look at this volatile, volatile period here. And there's the COVID crash. But the point is, make sure if you're doing or looking at a back test that it covers these periods or covers at least two market cycles. So now I wanna do just a basic test with the S&P 500 stocks and the 200 day moving average, all signals. And we're gonna just take every signal cross. And the first one we have here is the 100, 200 cross. And then we smooth with a 500, 200 cross. So sorry, five 200 cross, the five day crossing above and below the 200 day. Then the 20-day, we're smoothing that even further. 
in the 50 day. And if we look at the results here, as we go from the close to the five day, to the 20 day, to the 50 day, you can see the win percent increases from 23% to 46%. So smoothing helps. Then if we see the average gain, well, the gain loss ratio uh, goes down from six to three. But the benefit is you got that higher win percent. And the most important, I think, is this profit factor. And profit factor is the total gains divided by the total losses. That's like an ex post reward to risk ratio. So if you have a profit factor of two, that means you're making $2 for every dollar you lose. And so you can see here, this 5200 cross has a 2.54 profit factor. Now, personally, I don't like this one that much because it has a pretty high drawdown. It has a pretty big lag. And so what I did was, I'm gonna go back. Um, I'm thinking that the 2200 seems to be a sweet spot here. And that's the one I'm going to test. So that's the all signals test. So now I just wanted to throw in a 525 cross because I said that 125 days is my sweet spot for these indicators. But a moving average is, you know, it's got, if you got a 200 day moving average, well, you take the midpoint of that 200 day moving average, you're going back way, you're going back a lot. And so the longer it is, the smoother it's going to be and the more lag it's going to have. But I just threw in this test if we had the five period moving average crossing above the 125 day. Your win rate was 30%, your gain loss ratio was four, and your profit factor was below two. So it wasn't that great. I think the 200 day with S&P 500 stocks is the one you want to use. So what we did here was we went through the MA cross test with the S&P 500 stocks. And I'm going to go forward here because we're going to look at the, we're gonna focus on the 2200 cross. And so here's the 2200 cross and we can compare it to the trend composite turning positive or negative. And we can see here that the total trades, yeah, roughly the same, a few more, thousand more with the trend composite. The win percent, roughly the same, 38, 40%. We look at the gain loss ratio. You have a higher gain loss ratio with the 2200 cross, 3.73 versus 3.26. Profit factors are pretty close. So these systems are fairly close, the trend composite and the 2200 cross. Now notice I'm not using a market filter. So that means I'm not paying attention to the trend of the S&P 500, the broad market trend, which is the single most important aspect when you're looking at a strategy. So what I'm doing as well with these strategies is I'm using a 125 day rate of change as the momentum tie break. So what we're gonna do here, let me back up, so we're doing a all signals test here, every single signal. That's why you have 10,000 plus trades. And if I go here, we're gonna to go to a portfolio level test. There you can see up there. So we're taking the top 25 stocks, well, the 25 stocks that generate trend signals, and we're doing the same thing, we're buying, the next open when we get a signal on the close. And we're going to compare the 20 200 cross to the trend composite turning positive or negative. Because when you go from all signals to a portfolio, that's a little bit more realistic as far as what you're going to be dealing with if you're running this strategy. You're not going to run a strategy based on every single signal in the S&P 500. Most likely, you're going to select 20 to 25 stocks. And studies have shown that, you know, once you get above 25, your diversification benefits go down quite dramatically. So 25 is about the maximum number of positions that I think you would want. So if we do this portfolio level test, we can see that there are 
there are going to be a lot fewer trades. First of all, you have 1,000 trades for the 2200 cross, 1,200 trades for the trend composite. We look at the compound annual return, 6.75% for the 2200 versus 8% for the trend composite. So the trend composite gets the edge there. The maximum drawdown, huge, 41%, 45%. That is not tolerable. Again, there's the number of trades. The win rates were about the same. So that stayed stable versus the all signals test. And the profit factor stayed the same, was two for both of them. So not too bad. And as I said before, uh, for a portfolio, if you get two signals and you only have place for one, then you take the stock with the highest 125-day rate of change. And that gives you the momentum aspect. And that is important to market timing and getting some beta or outperformance. So now I want to look at broad market timing because we did this portfolio test without the benefit of knowing the trend for the S&P 500. And we need to know the trend for the S&P 500 in order to limit those drawdowns and only trade stocks when the S&P 500 is trending up and get out when the S&P 500 moves into a bear market. We need to preserve capital. And so how do we choose a market regime filter? So what I did was I tested SPY using different crossovers. As I said, the 200 day works really good with the S&P 500. And I think it works pretty good with S&P 500 stocks. Not so well with tech stocks like NASDAQ 100 and small caps. It doesn't work as well the 200 day, but the 200 day seems to work real well with S&P 500 stocks and the S&P 500. So what I did here is I tested the S&P 500. This is buy and hold first. And I tested across, you close above and below the 200 day, you take a signal, use the five 200 cross, use the 20 200 cross and the 50 200 cross. So you can see the moving average is getting a little bit bigger each time. So Buy and hold 5.33% over the last 20 years without dividends. So that's not so great, but you know, it is what it is. If you did the 200 cross, you got 5.3%. If you smooth with a five-day moving average, you got up to 6.21%. And then your return dropped and then went up with the 5,200 cross. We look at the maximum drawdown. Buy and hold, your maximum drawdown was 56%. You basically had two 50% drawdowns and one 30% drawdown. And that was the COVID crash, crash. So you can see your drawdowns get to 20% if you just use the cross above and below the 200 day. Stays at 20% with the five 200 cross. And it increases when you get to the 20 and the 50 day crossing above the 200 day. So that's not good. Looking at the five 200 crosses, looking favorable here. And then if we look at the profit factor, we can see it does go up with each extension of the moving average. But for my money, I think that that five 200 captures the sweet spot because it's gonna get me out in time or stop me from taking positions when the market or the S&P 500 turns down and the stock market potentially goes into a bear swing. So we're gonna apply a market regime filter. So here we can see, this is an example of the S&P 500 with the five 200 cross. So we've got an oscillator at the bottom. That's the difference between the five day moving average and the 200 day moving average. And you can see you're gonna get whipsaws, but it's gonna keep you out of these big declines. And like any trend following indicator, you're gonna get back in not at the bottom, but after the trend has moved off the bottom and it extended. And then you would have gotten out just in March there. So you'd have avoided most of that COVID crash there. And then if we look at 2016, you would have had some whipsaws in 2015, but you would have caught a really good trend here in early 2016. And you wouldn't have gotten whipsawed in early 2018. And then you would have gotten out there in the latter part of 2018, but that was a monster trend. 
So when you're using that market timing, that market regime filter, you're still gonna get whipsaws, but you get the safety of getting out during a bear market and you get the benefit of catching a big trend should it develop. So now we're gonna go back to that test that I did, the portfolio level test, 25 stocks, S&P 500. And we're gonna see that this is without the market filter on the top. So the 2200 cross, the positive negative trend composite cross basically. And you can see here that the compound annual return when you added a market filter, which is the table below increased. So we got above 9% for each strategy when we added that market regime filter. And exposure was of course lower because you were out during bear markets. But look at the maximum drawdown. You had 41 and 45% maximum drawdown without the market filter. And you add that market regime filter and your drawdown got to 22% with the trend composite, not bad. You look at the total number of trades, you're gonna have fewer trades because you're not trading during bear markets. Your win rate went up a little bit from 37, 38% to 41, 42%. And you can see the profit factor went up from around two to around 2.6. So clearly there's a benefit of staying out of bear markets, moving to cash and preparing for the next bull market. You need to have some dry powder when the bull market comes. So what about this momentum edge? I mentioned that when you have a portfolio of 25 stocks, sometimes you have 24 positions, you need to add one more position, you're waiting for a signal and you get two signals and you have to choose. Well, how do you choose? Well, you choose the one with the highest 125 day rate of change because that gives you the one with the most momentum. And so I did a little comparison. Now we're on the trend composite. We're buying and selling when the trend composite turns positive or negative. And this is buying and selling stocks with a high rate of change. Your compound annual return was 9.37%. And if you did ones with a low rate of change, then your compound annual return dropped to 7.2%. So by using this momentum aspect, you're getting a little bit of outperformance in there. And that helps. Go back here. You can see it didn't affect the maximum drawdown. There we go. So here's a couple of chart examples that we can see. So this is ResMed. And we can see that it triggered bullish on June 10th. And that is the gray vertical line. That's when the momentum composite turned positive. And we can see the rate of change was 4.41%, 125-day rate of change. And it had a pretty good gain up until early November. But you also had a signal on June 10th for Dexcom and its rate of change at that time was much higher, 19.67%. And you can see that it's up 58%. So it seriously outperformed. Now, yeah, I cherry picked it. But as you can see from the back test in the previous slide here, I did it over these all of these trades. And if you just had that little edge by picking the ones with the highest momentum and avoiding the ones with the lowest momentum, you got a little bit of extra performance out of that. And that's what I mean by taking some incremental steps as far as ways to improve your performance. So expectations versus reality. So this is what we think about when we think of a perfect equity curve. It goes from the lower left to the upper right with very small drawdowns. But of course, that is not realistic. More realistic is we're gonna have periods of flat performance. We're gonna have drawdowns and let's see how those look like. So this is the equity curve for the trend composite. And you can see here that it is volatile. And this is what trend following is really like. You're gonna have flat periods and this is flat because it's a bear market, you're not trading, but you're gonna catch the bull run. And then you're going to go out during the bear market of 2008. And then you're going to catch a bull run. 
And then you get a little chaos. In 2011, European sovereign debt crisis. So you had a flat performance, but then you caught a bull run. And then you had a dip into early 2016, and then you caught a monster bull run when your portfolio went from around 2.7 to 5.3. This is million, started out with a million. And then you had a big drawdown. So you had a, a sharp drawdown and then a bounce and then the COVID crash hit. But then look at this run here. So you had a big run after the COVID crash. And so how does this look as far as drawdowns are concerned? Kind of highlighted those and now I'm gonna move forward. So here's the S&P 500 buy and hold, the blue line. And then here is the portfolio for the trend composite. And you can see it outperformed S&P 500 buy and hold with fewer drawdowns, more than almost more than twice as much. So here are the drawdowns for the trend composite. So you can see here, this is what you're gonna be dealing with if you're trading it. You know, you're gonna get several drawdowns over a 20 year period that are gonna be in that 12 to 18% range. And the biggest drawdown was around 22% when we had the COVID crash there. And that stuff is going to happen. But you can see it's not a straight line up. Your portfolio is going to be down on certain periods. And we just have to live with these and think of the next 1,000 trades. Nick Raj. So key takeaways that I want you to consider when you're thinking about a trend following strategy. Trend following is not easy. All right, it's going to take work. It's going to take some dedication. Whipsaws occur, but again, there it is, the next 1,000 trades. And simple and consistent beats complex and changing. You don't need to go changing your strategy based on the last six months of what the market did. All right, that's why I, that these strategies are very, very simple as far as I'm concerned. And that's why I don't think they're, they're not curve-fitted and I think, sure, they're gonna go through their drawdowns, but I think over the next 1,000 trades, they have a good chance of outperforming. Find your sweet spot. What trend works for you? Six months works for me. Maybe yours is shorter, maybe yours is longer, but I think six to 12 months is the frame we wanna be looking at when it comes to trend following. Add some smoothing to reduce whipsaws. Don't use the close above and below the 200 day because you're gonna get lots of whipsaws there. Smooth it out with a five-day moving average or a 20-day moving average for stocks. S&P 500, SPY, a five-day moving average is fine. Individual stocks are a little bit more volatile. So a 20-day, I think, is more appropriate there. Add a market filter to control your drawdowns, all right? You need to be long stocks when the S&P 500 is in a bull market and out of stocks in a bear market. Add a momentum tie break to improve performance. After all, we're capturing beta, and that is momentum. Now, what do you want to do for next steps as far as if you want to pursue trend following a little bit more? Well, consider focusing on stocks in the offensive sectors like technology and industrials and healthcare and consumer discretionary, and maybe just avoiding staples and utilities and REITs. Uh, energy, that's up for debate. Position sizing to control risk. You know, if you're taking a position in a Tesla, well, it's got a lot more volatility than say, if you're taking a position in Walmart. So maybe you want to position size accordingly, maybe a smaller position in Tesla than in Walmart to control risk. You might consider a trailing stop instead of a trend reversal exit. That ATR trailing stop is part of the Trend Investor Pro Indicator Edge plugin, and that can be used there. You also might consider a profit target to lock in grains, gains. Now, a profit target is not like in the trend following lexicon, I don't think. It's trend followers, they ride the trend until the end, the bitter end. And I have found in backtesting, that if you put a profit target on there and you exit at a certain profit level, you can limit your drawdowns and capture some of those excess gains 
maybe close half of your position if it goes up 20% or something. If you wanna learn more about trend following, Top Traders Unplugged is a great website. I mean, they've got some hardcore trend followers on there every week. Jerry Parker, Turtle Trader, original Turtle Trader is on there. Richard Brennan, you can see here, he's a trend follower also out of Australia. So I'd recommend you check out that website. They got a great podcast. Also, you can check out trendinvestorpro.com forward slash free. And this is a snapshot of what you can see there. I've got a number of free articles on there. And I've also got a table for the S&P 500 stocks that show the trend composite signals. And this is a screenshot, so I can't really run through the table, but you can see it's very simple. It's the name and you can click on these headings to sort it. So we got the name, the symbol, the trend composite, which goes from plus five to minus five. So anything positive is a bullish trend composite signal. And so you can click that column to sort. You can see if it's in an uptrend or a downtrend. You can see the date of the signal, number of bars of the signal since the signal, and the percentage change. And that percentage change, you can see over on the right here, Apple's up 109% since its trend signal on May 1st. Uh, but you can see Abbott here, Abbott Laboratories is not performing as good. It's got an uptrend, but its percentage change is only 2.3%. So not all stocks or signals are created equal. You are going to get those whipsaws. And so where does that bring us? That brings us full circle all the way back to trendinvestorpro.com. And I run a, a composite breadth model for my broad market timing. Uh, it's a little more complicated than the 5200 cross, uh, but I think in my test, it has captured the trend signals a little bit better for the broader market because it uses breadth for the S&P 1500, which really is the broader market. So I use that for broad market timing. I do trend momentum strategies for ETFs. As I said, I've got 129 ETFs in my core list, but I've also got an all weather list. It just has 50 ETFs. So I've taken that big list and I've condensed it down to 50 essential ETFs that cover all bases. And that is used for my main stoke close strategy as far as trend following is concerned. And then I do the discretionary side as well with the ETF trends, patterns, and setups report. I got the ranking and signals table, which I update every Thursday. And I've got a number of strategy articles and videos for that have a longer shelf life. If you want to learn about something, there's a seven part series on the Stoke Close Indicator and its signals. And so if there are any questions out there, I would open the floor up to questions. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in and taking time out of your Saturday to join us here on Stock Charts TV. And thanks to the staff of Stock Charts TV for coming in on a Saturday morning. So um, I got a question, do you prefer exponential or simple moving averages? And I know the Keltner channels use exponential moving averages. The Bollinger Bands use simple moving averages. Personally, I use the EMA for Keltner because that's the way it was developed. But personally, I like simple moving averages because I like to smooth it a little bit. And when I tested exponential and simple moving averages, I noticed that you got more whipsaws with the exponential moving average. And, and so a simple moving average removes some of those whipsaws. And I'm all about removing whipsaws and controlling those drawdowns. Um, what is the difference between trend and momentum? And that's a good question. So, so trend is basically the direction. Uh, trend, you can be going up and that's an uptrend or you can be going up and that's an uptrend. Whereas momentum is the rate of change. So it's kind of like the steep, steepness of a trend. So if you have a trend that's not very steep, it's still an uptrend, 
But if you have a trend that's very steep, that's the momentum. And that's what we want to look for is that steepness of trend to capture the momentum leaders. So it looks like a slow Saturday. I don't think everybody's got their Java in them yet. Uh, it's 5.55 here in Belgium. So we're getting ready to have a, a trapeze and dinner. But again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in here on a Saturday. Check out Stock Charts TV if you want to see more videos from a great uh, set of authors and analysts. Uh, check out Stock Charts ACP if you want interactive charting. Check out Trend Investor Pro if you want to learn more about ETFs and my strategies. So thanks again for tuning in. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you again soon. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.